Okay, so we talked about loving your enemies this week, and there's lots of really fair questions that have come come up about that. So yeah. just wanted to take some time to address some of those. Okay. So any any initial thoughts on um, so Jesus is asking us to to love our enemies. How does that square with maybe some some difficult things that the rest of the scriptures say? Yeah. So I think. Um, when we talk about the difficult things that the rest of the scripture says, uh, we've got a bunch of different kinds of things in mind, but they're all related. One is hell. Um, if God loves his enemies, then why would he punish anyone in hell? Um, one is like Old Testament conquest. God loves his enemies. How could he tell his people to kill other people in the Old Testament? Um, and then there's specific instances of his wrath seemingly overcoming people whether it's Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5, or Nadab and Abihu, or Uzzah and the Ark, or whoever it is. So we've got these questions of, um, is it really true that God loves his enemies? If so, how in the world can he be so violent? I'm always struck by the fact that Jesus doesn't shy away from this, but he also doesn't entirely answer it. Um, which I wonder if there's some sort of instruction there. Of he, I don't think he's asking us to be indifferent, but I do sometimes think he's asking us to prioritize uh, what we really spend our time and focus and energy on. Um, but I also wonder if part of what Jesus and the scriptures are doing is um, trying to just reiterate their concern for justice in a way that can't be misinterpreted. Because I think a natural care for justice uh, starts to sound like there's some sort of uh, like significant correction on the back end, which may or may not be experienced as violence by the person undergoing or experiencing such correction. Um, what do you mean by that? Well, so um, when things are wrong in the world, if God's indifferent to that, then there's a real problem with God's goodness. Mm -hmm. But if things are wrong in the world and God can fix them, then he needs to fix them. But how he fixes them might be experienced as good by some parties and bad by other parties. Um, it's the somewhat cliched saying that I feel like I reference all the time, which is uh, the same sun that hardens the ice or melts the ice hardens the clay. Um, so in that kind of goofy example, you've got the same input coming, but just by two different natures of uh, substance, two different circumstances, they react to that input very differently. Um, and I wonder if the same is the case for people, where whatever God's justice looks like um, can be delightful and joyous for a bunch of us who are looking for that and might feel violent and burning and awful for people who want anything but that. Um, that helps me um, process a lot of what God's wrath might look like. It also helps me uh, think about why Jesus might not have over-explained this. Okay. Um, because I think, he, I think God needs us to understand that there's going to be real change, that justice is coming. Um, I think there's something motivating about that as... Infantilizing, infantilizing as that might be, um, I think it helps us to. I think it helps those of us who are undergoing injustice to really hope that God's not indifferent and we get to cling to that just because we see how forcefully He wants to correct it. Um, and I think those of us who are participating in injustice um, are strongly encouraged to stop by some of the strong um, language around it. Okay. Um, but that may or may not be, be indicative of what's actually going to happen. Right. Um, now, I don't mean to like completely uh, elude and say that God's lying to us, not at all, but I think that sometimes what he does is he gives us half of a statement and then doesn't give us the second half of a statement for a really long time. And the second half of the statement completely changes the way we hear and understand the first half of the statement. Um, so one of the clearest ways this has happened um, in my own thinking is uh, 
you, you've got these Old Testament prophecies that this lion of the tribe of Judah is going to come and conquer the world. Um, and then you've got in Revelation 5, you've got this picture where the Apostle John is caught up in this vision into this heavenly throne room um, where there's weeping in the presence of God um, over this task that's not able to be accomplished. And who can accomplish this task? Who can um, unroll this scroll? Who can do this thing? Nobody can do it. Nobody's worthy to do it. And there's weeping and weeping and weeping. Um, and finally, one of the elders in heaven comes to John and says, Stop your weeping. Dry your tears. Look, somebody has been found that's worthy to complete this task and bring about, you know, just kind of the, the justice and rectification of the world. Um, look, one who has conquered the lion of the tribe of Judah. Um, so obviously kind of unearthing and revisiting some of that Old Testament imagery. And yet as John dries his eyes and he looks towards the throne of God, what he sees is not a conquering lion, but a slaughtered lamb. Um, and, and that's what he says. It just transitions very quickly from, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah who's conquered. And I beheld, and there was a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Um, so it's not that the lion of the tribe of Judah didn't conquer. That's the first part of the statement that remains true, and yet the second half of the statement completely changes how it's true, that um, God somehow became the lion who conquered, um, not in spite of being the lamb who was slaughtered, but precisely by being the lamb who was slaughtered. Um, and that sort of recasting um, makes me want to hold on to uh, some of the statements about wrath and justice and vengeance and repayment and all these kinds of things, because I think they're absolutely true. Um, and yet in light of Jesus, in light of him being the slaughtered lamb, in light of him being the one who loves his enemies even to death, um, makes me want to start to reinterpret all of those first half statements, um, perhaps pretty significantly, because I think that's what Jesus himself is doing. Um, now, that doesn't solve every problem that we have with, um, say, the Old Testament texts or um, some of God's stuff, but, but it helps us start to, um, I guess, form a paradigm for how we might go about looking at these things. So basically what I want to do is I want to say, um, hey, I know with absolute conviction that Jesus is true, that Jesus is right. Um, Jesus is who he says he is, that his ethics are um, what he said they were, and that um, that is the primary thing I'm going to hold on to. And then I wanted to, clinging to that, start to reinterpret the rest of the way I experience the world, the rest of the way I experience myself, and even the rest of the way that I read the rest of the scriptures. Because um, I think that's what John models for us in this Revelation 5 passage, but I think it's what um, Jesus does for us in general, is he says, um, you've heard it said about the Old Testament, from the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, an eye for an eye, but I tell you, um, that's not good enough. Go above and beyond. I need you to really love um, your enemies. I need you to really not resist violence. I need you to um, go the extra mile, give the extra article of clothing, um, and turn the other cheek. Um, so, so that paradigm is, I want to assume that Jesus is absolutely true and Jesus is clear. I want to assume the rest of scripture is true, um, but not necessarily clear. And I want to then start searching for that clarity in light of Jesus, because I think Jesus illuminates and starts to change um, how we uh, interpret the rest of scripture.